Hi, I'm Professor David Atley, and this is Topics in Astronomy. In this video, I'll be introducing the scientific process. So what is it? Why is it important? How does it function? And then as you progress through a course of study in astronomy, one theme that you should notice coming back over and over again is how the scientific process influences the work that we do and the way that we develop an understanding of our solar system and the broader universe. Let's get started. First, let's think a little bit about how we might describe science as a discipline. Pause the video for a second and try and think. What are some words that you would use to describe science? Did you pause? Well, if not, that's okay. Here are some words that I've chosen to describe science. I've chosen words like iterative, collaborative, systematic, but error-prone, statistical, mathematical, data-driven, and ethical. I'll dive into a few of these and expand on some of those ideas over the next few minutes, but for the ones that I don't consider, like statistical or mathematical, keep those in mind as you work through your course of study and see how those ideas might come back. What does it mean that science is iterative? I think that idea is best encapsulated in this famous quote, usually attributed to Sir Isaac Newton, and then of course quoted by many others since then, which is, if I have seen further than others, it was by standing upon the shoulders of giants. No matter how brilliant you are, and Isaac Newton was indisputably brilliant, you always have to rely on work done by people who came before you. You can't develop an entire system of understanding of the world from first principles on your own. We simply don't live long enough to do that. So you have to base your work on work done by previous people. So you have to trust that other people have done their due diligence and build from there. One of the things that we have to do is do that due diligence, both on our own work and then on our contemporaries. So that's why in the previous slide, I chose the word error prone. Humans make mistakes. One of the values of the scientific process is it gives us a tool to identify those mistakes and correct them systematically. What is science? I had to define it. I would say that it is a process, and that's the most important thing. It's a process that uses systematic observation and experimentation to learn about the nature of the universe. Normally, uh, if this were any other class except for astronomy, I might say about the nature of the world. But we're interested in much bigger themes than that, so I've replaced world with the universe. And this definition encapsulates lots of different disciplines. For sure, it covers astronomy and physics and chemistry, the things that you might normally think of as the hard physical sciences. It covers things like biology, but it also captures the social sciences, disciplines like history or anthropology or sociology, which despite their uh, different nature, still rely on specific quantifiable information to accept or reject hypotheses. I also said that science is ethical. All sciences rely on certain standards of ethics, like don't falsify your data, use data from other people only with their permission, which we often do because science is also collaborative. This is especially important in disciplines like biology or medicine, when you often work with human or animal subjects which have rights of their own. Most major universities and uh, labs will have very strict rules regarding human experimentation and you have to go through a committee process to get permission before you can conduct a trial using human or animals. There is a famous example where this process got short-circuited a few years ago by uh, He Zhangke, uh, who's a Chinese geneticist. He implanted altered genomes into two 
twins who were then carried to term by their mother. Um, and he added a gene to their genome using a process called CRISPR to make them immune to the HIV virus. Uh, but because he short-circuited these safety procedures for human trials, he was roundly condemned for his violation of scientific ethics. And then subsequently, we later found out that the introduction of that gene to make these two children immune to the HIV virus probably also introduced vulnerabilities to other diseases. So that's why we have these safeguards in place and why ethics in science are so important. So let's look now at how this process actually goes. I said that science is a process, and it definitely is, and it has some steps that have been formalized over the centuries. The version that I'm about to walk through to, with you is usually attributed to the English scientist and philosopher Francis Bacon. When you learned about the scientific process in school, uh, you may have learned that the first step is hypothesis, and we'll come to that in a minute. But really, the first thing that any scientist has to do in order to carry out their work is to identify a problem. And in practice, this is the hardest part about all of science. Collecting data, designing an experiment, going through and doing statistical data analysis that carefully respects the best knowledge of how to massage your data and figure out what it's telling you. All of that is tricky, but identifying important tractable problems requires a deep knowledge of your field and also a fair amount of creativity. And I've encapsulated this with the quote, that's funny, in which someone looks at the world and sees something that he or she doesn't understand and goes, that's funny, I wonder why that happens. Uh, so for example, a few thousand years ago, we might look out into the world and say, things fall to the ground. Why do things fall to the ground? That's our problem. And from there, we can then proceed on to the next stage in the scientific process, which is hypothesis, a guess at a solution. So we just kind of Vulcan mind meld our way into a proposed solution for the problem that we identified in the first step. Uh, so for example, if you'd asked people a few thousand years ago why objects fall to the ground, they might tell you that objects are made of a combination of four basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And based on which elements are found in a particular object, that's going to tell you how quickly that object will fall to the ground. Objects with lots of earth are trying to get back to the earth, whereas objects with lots of air or fire naturally are found above the earth, and so those objects might fall slower. That's the hypothesis for how this is supposed to work. Once we've got our hypothesis, we need to use it to make a prediction. And I sort of walked through that already, but let's make our prediction concrete. So let's take that hypothesis of the four elements due to the ancient Greek philosophers and make a specific prediction. We could predict that, say, a key should fall faster than a piece of paper. Once we've got that prediction, we then have to test it. And that's where experimentation and observation come in. So we can either use a telescope to look out into the, into the sky, or look at the humans around us, or design an experiment in our lab to test the prediction of our hypothesis. So for that key and paper prediction, I might go and actually try it. Okay, let's try that experiment. I've got a key, which is made of metal. Metal comes from the ground, so this is mostly the element earth, according to the ancients. And I have paper. Paper is made from trees which grow out of the ground, but they also include air and water so the prediction is that the key should fall faster than the paper. Let's try it. Indeed, that's exactly what happened. Okay, so in that case, my prediction was correct. The key really did fall faster than a piece of paper, but oftentimes that's not true. So generally speaking, we're going to have to repeat. We're going to find that our prediction was incorrect and we'll have to go back and modify our hypothesis to take into account new data, 
go through the whole thing again. And again, and again, and again. This is why I said science is iterative. You have to try things over and over and over again before you converge towards truth. But eventually, after lots of different experiments with modified hypotheses, we're going to take the results of all of our experiments together and try and come up with an answer to our problem. And that's the final stage, the synthesis stage. If you're lucky, if you've chosen a broadly applicable problem and done just the right experiments, maybe you'll even be able to produce a scientific theory at the end of the process. A scientific theory is a single idea that correctly predicts the outcome of many different experiments. There are lots of examples of scientific theories out in the world, literally hundreds at least. Try and think of some. Pause the video for a second and try and come up with a mental list. Go ahead, I'll wait. What was in your list? Here's a brief list that I've come up with. It includes ideas like Newton's theory of gravity, or the special and general theories of relativity, or the Big Bang theory. All of these are relevant to astronomy. They're not the only ones. There's some, a few more on the slide and many, many others. The ones that I listed are going to come back as we work through some introductory astronomy topics, but if your idea of a scientific theory wasn't on the list, that's okay. We've talked about the scientific process, which is sometimes called the scientific method. It provides a structure to organize our observational or experimental work in order to generate new knowledge and to gain a better understanding of the world or the universe around us. It's a process that relies on repeated predictions and experimentations and then modifications of our original hypothesis to slowly but hopefully inexorably converge towards truth. At the end of this process, sometimes we generate scientific theories, which are single ideas that correctly predict the outcomes of many experiments, and these are superior in many ways to a scientific fact. A fact is something I can measure in a laboratory, like it takes half a second for a key to drop one meter. That's a fact. I can measure that. The reason that happens is because of how gravity behaves. So Newton's theory of gravity predicts that outcome along with many, many others, including how a football flies down a football field and how a spacecraft moves through the solar system. So the theory is, in that sense, superior to the facts. It sits above them and explains the facts as I can observe them. So there's nothing that a scientific theory could ever do to become a scientific fact. This is an important distinction, and if you take nothing else away from this series of videos, I want you to remember that, is that a scientific theory is not merely a theory. It is a theory, and that's great. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.